Why do we need jaguars? One, ecologically, they are, um, for the Americas, they are one of the top predators. And it is known that top predators are the ones that balance the ecosystem. If you remove a top predator who he eats meat, uh, and those ones that he eats are herbivores. So if you kill, remove the top predator, you're going to be left with an increasing population of herbivores, we can, you can, which can eventually just feed off and, and, and just remove the resource being plants. And we need plants. So in that effect, having the top predators balances the amount of herbivores. Therefore, the plants that they eat uh, is somewhat kept in balance. This episode is brought to you in part by our sponsor, Tidal Influence, a Californian ecological consulting firm who proudly supports environmental education and all of the diverse conservation efforts that Pelicanus works to highlight. Visit their website at tidalinfluence.com to learn more about what they do to conserve our coastal resources and how you can get involved. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pelicanus. Pelicanus is a nonprofit organization focused on sharing the movement that is and has been happening in the conservation field. Now, this is Conservation Conversations, our long form documentary style show that highlights the people and organizations that are making it their purpose to grow the conservation field and to show that people have and still are making monumental differences in our world with intentional change. Head over to pelicanus.org to find all of our episodes and more. On today's episode of Conservation Conversations, we talk with Emma Sanchez of Panthera Belize. Panthera is a global organization dedicated to conserving big cats, from African lions to cheetahs to leopards and more. Panthera Belize is a hub for the Jaguar Corridor Initiative, which is working to preserve the genetic integrity of the jaguar by connecting and protecting core jaguar populations in human landscapes from northern Mexico all the way to Argentina, among so much more. Thank you for tuning in. Let's let Emma talk all about how she and Panthera Belize conserves jaguars. Yeah, I guess so just to start, do you mind um, stating, uh, saying who you are and where you work? Okay, so my name is Emma Sanchez. I am the uh, country coordinator for Panthera Belize. So my job is mainly to oversee the operations that we have um, for Pantera and also the work that we do with our collaborators across Belize. So, I guess just to take a step back, what, what, would, what is the, so there's the larger Panthera organization mm-hmm. and then there's the local Panthera Belize. Yeah. What is the Panthera Belize specifically, what is the mission, what is it that you guys are really trying to do? Yeah, so Belize is part of the of the hub, and for Mesoamerica and northern um, Mexico, all the way to Argentina, the work is uh, focused on jaguars. So the conservation and the research of jaguars, and so in the case of Belize, uh, the main target species is the jaguar, and um, we try to. Um, most of the work presently is working in monitoring the population of jaguars and um, Belize is the one that has um, probably the only or it's probably the second one that I know of that has um, long-term monitoring of jaguars so um, I mean we want to continue that because uh, it actually uh, a lot of our, our colleagues have said that through our research, we, they are able to tell also when their uh, populations, because they're also doing monitoring, is like, is the population go, going okay? It's kind of like the base of what they can um, 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 inference on other countries of when um, that they're also doing monitoring. So it's kind of like we're treated as kind of like the lab <laughs> yeah. where things happen and then things are tested. And, and I mean, that's pretty exciting that other people find this our work, kind of like the model of what they want to do um, in other countries, especially, I'm, I'm not talking about just the Jaguar range. Yeah. Okay. And so the, the main focus is Jaguars. Is there any other? Yeah. So um, this year, especially, um, though Jaguars is the main focus, um, there's also, I mean, um, 
they started to think about, okay, so we cannot just do jaguars. There's other species that are sharing the environment with jaguars. And so since Pantera's main, uh, main target are large species of cats, um, this year they also included a small program called for s- small cat research. So together with um, the jaguar, especially the case here in Belize, we're not now adding the puma and also ocelot as like the main target species for for the country and anywhere else that has like this species and any other small species of cat they're also included in this um, if the, the species is considered of um, conservation concern so, so it would um, depend where you are um, in in Mesoamerica to, to do where do you, what conservation species you're looking at okay so is a puma considered a, a small cat in Central America? There's some like there's some people who consider them. I mean, within the like the cat people, they are considered small cats, like the small big cat, yeah. kind of like yeah. So um, it's kind of funny because I was like thinking, you know, it's a large cat, and then somebody said, no, but that you can we can consider that a small a small big cat. I was like, you need to decide. Is it a small <laughs> or a big cat? So, but anyway. And in the case of Belize, it, it was a consensus that um, that we should add a puma because um, in one of the studies that was done in Coxcomb um, back in 2010, I believe, 2010, it was published in 2010, it was um, noted that that pumas don't do really well in the human-dominated landscape. So, and many of the... Um, well, not that, not that we've done many um, monitoring or a lot of monitoring outside protected areas, but the few studies that have been done in the human-dominated landscape show that the pumas are, are being negatively affected outside of protected areas. So they are a conservation concern for Belize. Okay. We went to the Belize Zoo the other day, and we saw some of the pumas they had there, and they seemed pretty small compared to the ones we... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So it seems to be a p- pattern of like the northernmost um, uh, populations and the southernmost populations, they are larger than the Central American ones. And it's the same for the jaguars. The jaguars in the Pantanal are more are larger than the ones here in Mesoamerica. Um, and it could be related to the prey that they eat. Um, because, I mean, capybaras, uh, all of those things, they're, they're large prey. So you need a large animal to, to, to kill one of those, like, came under large um, prey species. So you need a big body, a, a large body, a large head to be mm-hmm. able to, to make a kill like that. So um, yeah, this theory that is related to the size of prey. And the other thing that is different is the thickness of the fur. So in the um, north and southern, southern ranges, they, there is more extreme weather conditions. So they would tend to grow that. And it doesn't make them a different species, it's just their adaptation is um, so that they can withstand the type of weather that they work, that they, that they live in. So it's, it's kind of, it's very interesting yeah. to see that pattern there. Um, and probably even the ocelot seems to be a little, a, little, a little larger. I haven't heard, it's just anecdotal information I have, but it seems that they're a little larger as well. What is it that, this is always a weird question to ask. <laughs> you know, basically I'm asking why do you guys exist? <laughs> but so the, another way to ask that is how, um, what happened to the jaguar? Why do you need the long-term management? What are the threats okay. to their populations? Yeah, so why do we need jaguars? Why are they important? One, ecologically, they are, um, for the Americas, they are one of the top predators. And it is known that top predators are the ones that balance the ecosystem. So without a top predator, uh, the system will be tilted to one side and we can have an increase of, uh, let's say, uh, the, the, just give it for example. If you remove a top predator who eat, eats meat, uh, and those ones that he eats are herbivores. So if you kill, remove the top predator, you're going to be left with an increasing population of herbivores, we can, you can, which can eventually just um, feed off and, and and just remove the resource being plants. And we need plants. So in that effect, 
having the top predators balances the amount of herbivores and the um, therefore the plants that they eat uh, is somewhat kept in balance and, and we don't have a, we don't we won't be a, there won't be a loss in in the um, plant species for example kind of like the uh the, the one in the U.S. is the, the the wolves at Yellowstone. Have you ever heard that, that story? That is the perfect example yeah. of that. Yeah, that's the perfect example. The cascade keeper, the predator cascade. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. The, um, yeah, the, there is a cascading effect when you remove that that predator. I mean, and it's not only um, remove. I mean, reintrodu- reintroducing the wolves did not only balance the prey but also change a lot of the ecosystem rivers that weren't there that when they started appearing so all of that is important so a top predator such as the jaguar is important for any ecosystem and um yeah this and also they're beautiful animals they're they're i mean i not many people get to see them but those who get to see them like they're always in awe of it so yeah that's awesome so over the last however many years that um, Panthera Belize has been involved in, you know, in existence and involved, what what are the main threats to jaguars? So um, I, I think across the board, is the main threat is habitat loss or habitat destruction, and paired with that becomes an, again another cascading cascading effects. You remove the habitat, you remove the uh, shelter in some ways, but you're also at the same time removing the, the, the vegetation, you're also kind of eventually going to lose water. So there's water source that is lost. Uh, and then in replacing that, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, development happening. And there's monoculture because you're, you're going to start uh, agriculture becomes monoculture and like large pieces of land are, are cleared up. Jaguars prefer um, broadleaf forest or high canopy, thick canopy. Um, when you're removing that, you don't, the, the ideal place for where jaguars uh, want to live is not there. And then once you have monoculture, it prevents jaguars, jaguar movement from one location to another. Um, take it example as if you're looking two different islands are separated by this large monoculture um, space. Jaguars wouldn't want to cross this one space that doesn't have cover for them to, in, in case they feel uh, threatened or anything. So they wouldn't want to cross from point A to point B or from one island to the other. So um, this part, like this, is what is mostly affecting jaguars, the habitat destruction. Uh, second to that, I would say hunting or poaching, and there's also, um, uh, I mean, these could be either for two reasons, either like any economic reason or because of um, little control um, related to attacks. So, and the other reason that is coming to be very important in the last I don't know, couple, couple of years is the illegal trade of body parts. Mm. So that seems to be picking up and it seems to be creating a problem. I mean, people don't consider it a major problem right now, but it seems that in the near future, it will become a major problem. So um, I would say those are the top two things. Uh, habitat destruction, and poaching and hunting. So I guess to kind of take a step back with the, when you said the habitat destruction and the fragmentation, do jaguars, do they have a really large range that they kind of need to overlap? Yeah. So jaguars are wide-ranging species. Um, the, just to give you an example, in Coxcomb, a cat, one of the cats that was... Um, uh, captured and collared with a GPS collar, it went up to 160 kilometers squared of space that he used within a 10 month period. Wow. Um, and that's an area that is considered, Coxum is, is, is an area that is considered a, of like the optimal hab- habitat type that they can have. Um, take it for example, north of here, which is like 30 minutes away from here, it's um, the Central Belize Corridor. 
um, monitoring there has happened. Um, there seems at the time when this the monitor occur, occurred, the population seemed to be stable but declining. Um, and during that time the study was happening, there was also coloring happening by another by a PhD student um, at the time. So that I believe the area that 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 like the highs that they recorded was, if I'm not mistaken, I hope that I'm not wrong, was around 600 kilometers squared. Um, and then I don't know. I would classify that like a second secondary optimal um, habitat that they can have. And apparently in Guatemala, it was even higher than that. So within a short period, a short distance, Belize and Guatemala, they're, we're neighbors. It changes a lot to even triple the amount of distance that they travel. We know that that is related to the type of forest or the type of habitat they're in. Uh, I mean, coxcomb, it's a very, there's available prey everywhere they go. So they don't have to go roam far to eat. They don't have to roam far to um, to have water. And also, there's, I would say there's a healthy population of females. So mating is not a problem. When it comes to other areas, yeah, there's a problem. It's not, I would say, scarcity. scarcity. But there's definitely lower amount of food, there's lower amounts of water, and likely um, not that much mating um, events. Mm. It does happen, but I would say a lot less than it would happen in Cox School. Yeah. Talk, talked about their, their range, and they can vary in size depending on the, the uh, quality of their habitat. Um, is that both males and females, or is that just the males that have the long, large range? Yeah, they, they, this is definitely biased towards males. Males are the ones that are dispersers. So they are the ones who are going to move away from the, from the mother's home range and go somewhere else and establish itself uh, and make a home range, a home for, for himself. So and while females, um, they, send, they tend to stick around near where the mother is um, and they don't roam very far. Does the reason why, um, like finding a female in in, in a in, in a very um, uh, like less optimal habitat is very exciting because then that means that there is a possibility that there is um, reproduction happening um, because without the females then we won't have that um, passing on gene um, and and continuing with the generation. So females are very important with with for the conservation of, of jaguars. They are necessary for uh, reproduction to happen. So, yeah, the males would be the one who would be dispersing and they move very far. Um, just to give an example, in, in Coxcomb we have, well, first of all, there's a, another professor that works. She's from, from the US. She's done also um, long-term monitoring here. Like almost the same as the amount of data that Pantera possesses. So we exchanged, exchanged the data and we realized that throughout the 10 year period there has been um, several exchanges of individuals between her data and our data. So um, it seems that, I don't know if you're familiar with the protected area system of Belize. So the Maya Mountain Massive has, let's see if I can get it correct, one, two, three, four, five, eight, if I'm not mistaken, eight different protected areas um, delineated because of rivers or whatever. So um, her, um, uh, one of her sites is on the far west and we, Coxcomb is on the far east of the Maya Mountains. Um, there were three males that were detected in her study area that crossed the, 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 um, the uh, mountain ridge and went to the Coxcomb. Mm. And then north of Belize has one of the largest blocks, uh, a second largest block of protected area called the Rio Bravo Conservation Management Area. One of these, the males again, uh, this is all males that were detected that made this long distance move, was from the Chiquibo, which is the far far west to northern 
um, leaves. It's around 120 kilometers of distance that he traveled. And it's amazing because between that, I mean, we don't know where he went through because we only have a point A and a point B. We don't have, we don't have like a, the movement pattern of where he crossed. So, and between that protected area and where he moved to, there is a lot of monoculture. There's a lot of communities. There's a lot of, um, so the, 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 the landscape is very fragmented. And since we took so long to do this collaborate, this exchange, we don't know when it happened within that 10 year period. Okay. It could have been earlier where the, the, the habitat was still okay for the move to happen, but we don't know that. Mm -hmm. So all of that was pretty interesting when we got that data. I mean, that, that's when I'm, I'm telling you, that it's mostly, it's all males that make this large move. And likewise, we've detected a movement from Coxcomb going south into Golden Stream, um, yeah, it's called, called Golden Stream Protected Area. So, and that's like 52 kilometers by a, by a single male. And again, they're the ones who are more bold to cross, um, say for example, the highways, because just as we had detected um, some of these movements, we also found out that um, a recent publication actually that, had, that was last year, uh, from the data of the corridor, um, and this is all camera data. It, it appears that the highway, the highway that you use to get here to Balmohan, which is the Kalin Western Highway, um, is now becoming a barrier for females. Mm. Females don't want to cross that road. They, I think, the last known event that happened was uh, it's, it was a picture that was taken by, by some tourists that, that by chance they got to see a female and, and it's called probably crossing that highway and that's that's been years now and within the data that was collected for that particular site um, yeah, females didn't seem to want to cross the highway while males they were like, yeah, they, yeah. they would do it more often yeah how do you guys interact with the whole Jaguar corridor? Because I can't imagine you guys manage the entire, you know, U.S. to Argentina. <laughs> no, uh, so each um, each country from Mexico all the way to Argentina, um, there's it's either um, Pantheras, Panthera offices are there, but also those that don't have it, we either have someone that we partner with and then they are the ones uh, who oversee the, the research monitoring and, and we just partner with them and provide them with either equipment, technical support and that kind of stuff to be able to keep the monitoring throughout the range. Um, and then for each country, um, years ago, um, um, there were pieces of land that were identified as corridors. So, and those corridors, uh, I, I believe within Mesoamerica, most, if not all, have been um, ground shooted. So checked if there's actually jugglers there, and interviewing people. There was a very uh, uh, tedious process I went through to to have it say, okay, this is a quarter. It can function as a quarter because X, Y, and Z are present within that landscape. Um, yeah, we cannot manage. Uh, the entire Jaguar range, just one one organization. From this office. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, even as a small country of Belize, we partner with several other organizations to be able to do this because we cannot do it on our own. Um, we need we require support from likewise organizations as individuals. So it it does take collaborative <laughs> effort to be able to do this kind of work. Yeah. That's a big thing we, we hit on a lot because everyone says the exact same thing. It's like, we can't do this alone. We need yeah. everyone to come together. And I guess it, kind of along the same lines, um, in terms of outreach, what do you, what do you guys do to, for outreach to the community, for outreach to you know, Western mm -hmm. societies, just to kind of raise the awareness mm -hmm. and kind of maybe raise funds? Or... Yeah. So when it comes to our outreach, it's basically, I would say, we're not big on that. As, as Pantera, the Pantera Belize office is not big on that because most of the effort for Pantera Belize is focused on monitoring and doing research. 
However, we do, as I said, we we partner with several other organizations, and since they are usually these people are these organizations are co-managers of the protected areas that they work for, for. so they are more like the local type of people that would be more suitable to work with communities around them. I think um, uh, any social scientist would say it takes a long time to be able to get to people and make them collaborate with you and be part of the effort because they don't easily trust anyone. We usually leave it to the partner organizations. We do obviously do help them if they need information to be able to pass it on. And that's where we mostly work for, to get the information and kind of like decrypt that for them so that they can give it to the uh, local person that, so they understand why is this important, why sh you should help us. And that's how it, that's the, that's basically how we do it here in Belize. Cool. And I, I would assume that the larger Panthera organization does a lot more of that, just worldwide. Yeah. Worldwide, they, they, um, there's a lot of different focuses of um, work. Um, there's, we definitely have in our team social scientists who work on this and they dedicate their lives to this. There's people who are dedicated to site security, so enforcement and, and looking at how to reduce poaching, hunting, and that kind of stuff. And then there's the other part that focuses on research and the geeky guys who just spend their time behind a computer and then you're like messing out with them. It's like, you can't do this because this doesn't work in real life. So that kind of thing, it, it, it's a whole chain of things that happen through all the organization and yeah. yeah. One of the things we've noticed is people that are in positions like yours, it, it's not a, coincidence and you have to be really good to get to this point <laughs> in your career <laughs> and anyone with that kind of drive and intelligence could have done anything mm. so why did they why did they go towards the save jaguar so uh, yeah. wh what is your background did you how, what made you get into okay. um i'm originally from north northern belize uh, it's known as uh, the as the sugar sugar well, local town is called Sugar City. That's the name that they put it on. So there's uh, my community, because I'm not from the town, so it's, it, I'm from, I grew up in a village, is surrounded by cane fields. And um, I remember as a kid, I, I, I mean, I, I like being outdoors. And me being a, a female, my dad's like, no, you're not, you can't go out. You need to stay in the house, because that, that's what happens. As I said, I'm curious. And I like this thing of like investigating, um, finding out answers to things. And um, I think that's how I got into this. That, and that's the reason why I like it so much because it's like I have questions and like how do these certain things happen or why do we do this on, and so forth. So uh, I remember in one of my courses, one of the teachers just were on a campfire on a field course like what do you want to do when you're done with your degrees like I want to be a researcher and a researcher here in Belize is unheard of it's an, an, it's something new that actually like people ask me it's like what do you do it's like hard to explain because it's not something that they relate to like the everyday person so it kind of, it's kind of hard for me to explain it because I, it's just for me it's just a feeling it's a hobby it's like so it's not like a job or if they do know about it, it's, yeah. a, it's a white man from the UK <laughs> and the US coming in to do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So it's hard to explain it to, to, to people. How, like, what do you do? It's like, I, and basically what comes out is like, I work with jowers. What do you do with jowers? <laughs> well, we put cameras in the trees and then we see what there comes and then you're able to identify them and count them and so forth. But it's a lot more than that. It's a lot more than just counting, looking at pictures. It's um, the environment. The, the people the, the, the people who manage protected areas so it's a very broad thing and it's difficult to explain it to uh, just friends common people who because um, before this it's yeah like I said it's unheard of of people becoming or having a career in research it's either you're a business owner you're a teacher you're a doctor those are easier to explain for me I would say um, I would think 
So yeah, that's how I came about to, to work with this. And funny story, so I was applying for different jobs and I was going to submit, like the, the attachment was there <laughs> on the email to send an application for a job. And, and um, that second I got a call from Bart and he's like, hey, do you, um, have you got a job? It's like, no, I don't have one. It's like, I, I think we have one for you. And I'm like, where? <laughs> It's like, do you want to do the annual monitoring in Coxcomb? It's like, sure. I didn't even think about it. Like, sure. So I went for it and he said, well, you're going to start next month. And I was like, okay. Yeah. Good. <laughs> That's the dream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say that um, it was horrible <laughs> the first time. But in the end, it was like so satisfying that you were able to get through the first uh, trails and like you're still alive. <laughs> So, and, and I got hooked because I get to spend a lot of time outdoors, something that I wanted to do um, as a kid that wasn't allowed to. And that's why I kind of like, okay, this is where I'm staying then, because this is, um, I mean, I, it came about from nowhere, and, and, and I stayed for a very long time, actually. So one of the things we were doing, I mean, we kind of already explained it, but is the, the good news. You know, we're trying to tell the good news. Hey, hey, it's not all doom and gloom, it's that. But what is it that gives you hope for the future, for you know, for mm-hmm. the local population of jaguars, um, just for Belize in general? What is it that kind of keeps you going? Makes you know, I, we we still got we still got to do some work, but we're gonna do it. I I think one of the things that keeps me both going is that um, there's a lot of um, I mean, in this last few years that that I. I realized that um, we've grown in partners of people who want to work with us, who are interested in jaguar conservation and interested in, in, in monitoring just wildlife in general, because putting a camera trap, you just don't only get jaguars, you get many other species along with it. So um, I think that's the part that drives me more because you, I've come to realize that we are not the only ones doing this, we're not the only ones who are interested in this. and, and um, it's, it's the thing that I want more people to learn with this and to um, be part of this. And I think now from the year, from when I started to, till now, I've seen that we've grown in the number of partners. And I think that's the one that, yeah, we can do this. And, and, and as I said, originally I was just working in Coxcomb and some in the central Belize, but because of these partners, now we're having information from the, my, the other side of the Maya Mountain Ridge. So Chiquibo, we have some, they, um, we're partnering with, with the organization called CSFI from the north, and they're also using our protocols that we've developed in camera trapping to do their monitoring at their site. So that is exciting, and that m- makes you want to do more because they're, you're, you don't feel alone anymore in this, so. How, how can people find uh, Panthera Belize and how can we help? Yeah, so one we can we have a Facebook page Panthera Belize, but also the global organization Panthera.org. Um, you can make donations through that um, website and how you have access to a lot of the um, newsletters, blogs that come from the different um, countries that that have Panteras. Uh, offices and the work that they do with tigers, lions, cheetahs, um, all of the big cats and some of the small cats now. So there's a lot of um, information coming in, publications that are coming in from the researchers that are um, part of Pantera. So um, yeah, and donations can be made to that website. And all of those go to going, goes back to monitoring our research and um, in some cases, uh, enforcement and security of some some um, some sites. Well, thank you so much for your time. No, we really appreciate you. it. Thank you. It was good to talk about this. Yeah. <laughs> we want to thank Emma Sanchez again for her time and sharing the story of Panthera Belize and her own story in conservation. So please look into Panthera and the work they do all over the world to protect big cats at panthera.org. You can also find Panthera Belize on Facebook. 
Host and producer for this episode is Austin Parker. Producer is Taylor Parker. Music was provided by A Picture Book Studios. So please like, comment, and subscribe to our page if you haven't already. And thank you again for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time.